morning, everyone. I'm uh, Ong Yeol-sung from Seoul Technical University. Uh, thank you for taking time of, uh, out of your uh, busy schedule. This is the first global webinar relating to the COVID-19 crisis and corporate governance in the field. Uh, I would appreciate uh, the effort by the ECJ staff, especially uh, by the uh, LA, uh, for preparing for this event. Uh, we are about to begin uh, the second session, which is jointly hosted by the two GCGC members, uh, University of Tokyo in Japan and Seoul National University in Korea. Uh, by the way, there are several housekeeping issues before we go any further. First of all, you are not required to stay online for the next 24 hours. Take a break, uh, take a nap, do some work, please just to do whatever you want to do. Uh, you can leave the webinar by clicking on the leave button uh, and when you, leave, uh, when you return to rejoin us, uh, please just use the same link uh, at any time throughout the event. Uh, please mute your uh, uh, microphone. Also, everyone's connection will work better uh, if you join by the video only when it is needed. If we have questions or comments, you have the, uh, two options. One is to use the Q&A Q &A function on the bottom uh, of the screen. And the other is by clicking raising your hand function. If it is possible, we will grant you speaking access. However, uh, the program is very full and we have a high volume of attendees, so we may not have to collect, uh, we may have to co uh, collect questions for after the event. Okay. So as notified in the registration, registration mayor, we are recording this event and it will be published on the ECGI website afterwards. So Elaine, uh, please start the recording now. Okay, we will start. So let me uh, introduce the speakers for these sessions. We have two presenters from uh, University of Tokyo Law Faculty. Uh, they will make a presentation for 10 minutes each and the comments will be open to all the discussants all the participants from Japan and Korea. So you may freely join the discussion. So uh, the first speaker is Professor Tomoyo Machi. Tomoyo Machi is here. Hello. Um, yeah. Uh, yeah. Who recently joined the prestigious University of Tokyo Commercial Law Faculty. The topic is, today's topic is uh, business continuity plan under the pandemic situation. So please welcome the uh, Professor Tom, uh, Tomoyo Machi. Uh, professor, Hi. the pro is yours. Oh, this is my room and I don't have proper room, so please uh, allow me to just uh, stop the video. But I would like to share the uh, PowerPoint uh, in a short time. Uh, so, um, this is the PowerPoint. Can you see the PowerPoint? Yes, you can see. Okay. It. Okay, then I'll start my presentation. So good morning, hello, and good evening. I don't know who is looking here, but thanks for viewing my presentation. The theme for my presentation is the business continuity plan on the pandemic situation. I think most of you already know the notion of BCP, the business continuity plan, but the image might be different from country to country. So firstly, I introduce how this notion came into place. The famous event in the world that announced the effectiveness of BCP was the 9-11, when Merrill Lynch had excellent recovery of its operation. When the you know, uh, planes attacked the World Trade Center, uh, it found uh, founded conference center in seven minutes and evacuated more than 2,000 workers from the building in 20 minutes. And then CEO uh, declared that it's back to normal when uh, the next day came. So it was like an amazing speed and everyone thought that the Merrill Lynch had an effective system of going back to normal. And the event of uh, emergency you imagine might be different according to your country. Some hazardous human activities or natural disaster 
but the basic idea is that you can come back to normal if you are prepared. And the rapid recovery benefits both your customers and investors. This idea became common as various countries and entities adopted it and imported it into their laws and principles. I think one of the most formal approach is the uh, UK Civil Contingencies Act. The act set out what is the emergency situations, who is the entities that should continue their service even when disasters are, there, are at their offer, off door, and what should be taken care of when they prepare for the emergency operation. The perspective of this act is the protection of nationals' lives when society became shattered apart. On the other hand, a COSO approached the necessity of preparedness in the form of internal risk assessment and control. ISO joined by endorsing corporations that they are resilient in hazardous situations. Their aim is that individual corporations should get prepared to mitigate damages. The basic steps for the corporations to prepare risks is that they make heat maps and decide to what risks they should focus first. It's like this. And what risks they can prepare in the course of time with, of course, the periodical, periodical reviews. The risk that pandemic or natural hazard contains has been considered to be situated near the end of long tail, which means that its frequencies are rather rare, but the estimated damage is great. The priority of preparedness to that type of risk is not necessarily high, and the approach is inevitably different corporations by corporations. In Japan, Due to the frequent earthquakes and typhoons, the necessity of rapid recovery of corporations and other organizations has been rather high. The characteristics of Japanese BCP are that it is formed under different ministries' controls. The BCP for hospitals is formed under the guideline of MHLW, Ministry of Health, Labor, and Welfare, and BCP for cooperation is discussed in the METI, Ministry of Economy, Trade, and Industry. And the ministry that is taking care of stimulating economy, the latter especially focused on information technology or the middle or small size entities recovery. So the preparation for pandemics has not been the mainstream of the discussion. Fortunately, a certain ratio of corporations prepared for pandemics as in 2009, new type of flu spread out in East Asia. The preparation contained in major cases, stockpiling masks and antiseptics. And in some cases, it covered the same office shutdown scenarios. I think in most cases, Japanese corporations did not have the plan to face this severe, this severe pandemic. So um, Japanese corporations basically has uh, many industries that need human hands and office, office workers also depended on face-to-face -face communications or document deliveries. So presently, most Japanese corporations are under severe inconveniences. But um, my impression is that even if you are prepared after being forced to close offices for long period of time, the plan might not make big difference as long as you prepare on your own. The BCP of each cooperation might be good for customers and stockholders as well in most uh, disasters, but not in the case of pandemics. Why? Because the damage from pandemic is much different from that from other disasters. 
you cannot evacuate to anywhere. Workers themselves are damaged and recoveries must be slow and gradual. Under this type of situation, the corporations are forced to focus on the stakeholders that they depend for their survival. Usually, they should take care of investors, but they must not be able to afford that consideration to them. I pick up interesting, interesting example from Japan. In Tokyo, urban department stores decided to shut down when governor requested to do so because they thought that uh, they uh, it's good for stakeholders, customers, and the workers to protect them from the infectious uh, uh, COVID-19. But when they decided it, the ministry uh, was not uh, satisfied because they thought that uh, giving providing food to urban people is their work because those urban people are depending on the uh, delicatessen uh, sold in the department basement floors. So thinking about the stakeholders in this situation is very complicated and very uh, it, uh, misleading. So BCP basically labels are uh, indispensable stakeholders in this kind of severe situation. Uh, priorities are usually placed on the uh, stakeholders that bring most profits to the corporation, but in these situations, the corporation must concentrate on the stakeholders that contribute most to their survival. So, for example, the industries damaged in pandemic situations must think that they should like make orders between the factory workers, customers, and the uh, other in, in other investors and the transaction partners. And the industries who need it, uh, who are in prosperous uh, status when in the pandemic, have to think about the workers, new customers, older customers, and other uh, investors. So it's for both uh, can, both kind of industries. It is a very difficult situation. So uh, if the risk assessment and the priority making priority decision is in the corporate manager's hands, it will be very confusing. And so perhaps the preference on the BCP needed to be monitored and communicated to investors beforehand. But in the COVID-19 kind of situations, I think the more effective approach must be like the UK one. The UK have the Civil Contingency Act, and in its chapter six, the corporations, designated corporations, have to prepare for the severe uh, emergency cases. And the shareholders just step back before the law's requirement and do not say whether this kind of decision is a good. I, uh, I'm sorry, uh, I think in this situation, the CSR consideration has its limits and the, in some cases, law must step in to uh, complete the decision. Thank you. Oh. Thank, you. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, Thank you very much, Professor Maxi. Uh, Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Yes, uh, Professor Maxi introduced the uh, BCP uh, to recover from a pandemic crisis and also mentioned that the current crisis caused by the COVID-19 has very different implications uh, in terms of BCP. 
So most importantly, uh, to Max emphasize that, that you know, this, uh, this crisis has some effect, uh, have very different effect on very different stakeholders. So uh, Professor Massey uh, emphasized that the board has to make very hard choice, which is likely to be very harmful uh, to investors and shareholders. So uh, I'd like to open the discussion to the floor. Uh, by the way, before you speak, please uh, briefly introduce your name and appreciations. Thank you very much. So any questions or comments on Massey's uh, presentation? Well, my presentation relates to the CSR consideration of the cooperative decisions. And so in some cases, it might relate to the next presentation from the Gengoto. So okay. perhaps uh, doing uh, the, uh, like we have to, uh, we might be able to just compare two presentations and and continue discussion afterwards, perhaps. Okay, uh, thank you very much for excellent suggestion. So, um, mm, Professor Koto's uh, presentation is also related to CSR, so we, uh, we will uh, discuss it after, uh, after Koto's pre presentation. So, the, uh, the second, Professor, uh, Professor Ken Koto, uh, are, you, uh, are you ready? Okay. So, yeah, yeah. So the next speaker is Professor uh, Ken Goto, uh, who teaches and researches globally, and so uh, and also very regularly participate in the GCGC conference. Uh, he also uh, talking about the CSR issues, and we can continue the discussion uh, after uh, his presentation. Please welcome, please, Professor Ken Goto. Professor, the floor is yours. Yeah, thank you, uh, Akriya, for this kind introduction. And uh, uh, good morning um, to everyone, uh, or good afternoon and good evening. So, uh, well, I first uh, also like to join my previous speakers uh, to thank the ECGI for uh, planning this uh, interesting uh, webinar, uh, which I think is very important attempt to um, keep uh, academic research ongoing. So. Um, so let me just uh, pull up my slides now. Um, okay, here we go. Okay, uh, so uh, as has been uh, introduced by Okrio, I'd like to talk uh, briefly about uh, CSR, Corporate Social Responsibilities. And um, so um, in, at a uh, GCGC meeting in Stockholm, uh, which was a few years ago, uh, so Oliver Hart had, uh, introduced his interesting paper on uh, shareholders' uh, welfare maximization. And there uh, he classified uh, CSR into two categories, uh, which is uh, one is uh, giving gifts to stakeholders, and the second is mitigation of negative externality beyond legal requirements. And uh, so we can observe uh, many examples of the first type, uh, give gifts to stakeholders, uh, ranging from uh, manufacturers donating uh, medical e equipment and uh, or tech companies offering uh, free software uh, to help people work from home. And uh, so there was an interesting post on Oxford, Oxford uh, Business World blog earlier this month uh, saying that, uh, well, these uh, CSR activities can be explained uh, by shareholder primacy, uh, because these activities would actually contribute to better repetition or obtaining new customers. So here, uh, 
today I would like to focus on the second category, uh, which is mitigation of neg negative externality. Uh, in uh, today's context, uh, this can be rephrased uh, to preventing the spread of COVID-19. Uh, well, this can be done in many ways, but perhaps most importantly by helping people to stay home. And this, uh, to do this, well, businesses can voluntarily close their shops or cancel their events and also let employees work from home uh, or take paid leave. And maybe we can add another thing here, uh, just as being posed uh, by Professor Matsui, uh, which is to open, keep their shops open uh, if they offer essential service uh, to maintain uh, living. So, uh, but uh, you might wonder why, especially if you're living outside of Japan, uh, that why I uh, focus on this aspect of C uh, in the context of CSL. Because um, it'll be actually much simpler if we resort to direct uh, regulation here. Uh, in other words, to lock down cities. But uh, the answer is that, well, actually such measure is not possible uh, in uh, legally available in Japan now. Uh, well, Tokyo is now in a state of emergency uh, since April 8th, but the uh, relevant statute, uh, which is Act for Special Measures Against Pandemic Influenza and New Infectious Diseases, um, well, this act only allows governors to make requests or issue orders, but without any legal sanction to businesses. And this soft approach is due to um, bitter experience of Japan during the World War II uh, with uh, military governments um, overusing um, martial law. So, uh, well, of course it is theoretically possible to enact more restrictive measures uh, used in China, Singapore, or France, Germany, UK, and US, but uh, this is not politically that easy and uh, it would take some time to introduce. So um, in current Japan, ultimate decisions uh, to close shops or to tell employees to stay at home uh, uh, are left in the hands of the management or individual shop owners. And well, this might be something specific to Japan and also maybe to Sweden, but uh, also in other countries, um, when the government uh, is not uh, declaring state of emergency or introducing curfew yet, then the issue will be the same. And uh, well, there's one uh, question in the sidetrack, uh, which is uh, the effectiveness of this Japanese soft state of emergency. But uh, let me just skip this slide for the sake of time, and I will come back to this later on if others are, if everyone is interested. So um, I would like to pose two fundamental questions. The first one uh, is, uh, should companies or businesses uh, voluntarily close their business even when it is against their short-term pecuniary interest and they are not ordered to close down. Well, Professor Hart um, suggested uh, at DCGC in Stockholm that, well, maybe directors should listen to their stakeholders by um, putting this up to shareholders voting. And if uh, many shareholders say that, well, we should respect the CSR here, then they should follow that way. But the problem here is that voting this a proper procedure, which is required in many countries, may not be available in times of emergency. Uh, one thing is that uh, maybe uh, discussed later on this webinar is that um, having a shareholders meeting uh, sometimes requires physical uh, gathering, and which is, may not be a good idea in this current situation. So uh, directors uh, need to decide on their own whether to close down or not. Then the question uh, becomes, uh, should directors who chose to continue their business uh, open, uh, should they be protected by the business judgment rule? Well, my tentative answer here is um, maybe yes. As, uh, because as Professor Matsui noted, 
uh, sometimes it is important to have some businesses open. But uh, I still think that uh, this protection uh, may not be given to the full extent because the discretion uh, given to directors in this situation could be much narrower in the, compared to the regular times. Well, if you keep the businesses open and if that leads to uh, having some employees or your customers being infected by COVID-19, and this can be um, expected, then uh, directors really need to think seriously uh, whether it is really good to uh, have their shops open or to at least temporarily uh, close down their shops. So uh, this is the first question. And the second question is that when then, if companies choose to close down, then should they be compensated by taxpayers' money for their loss? And this is now actually a um, large issue in Japan. Well, the Tokyo uh, Metropolitan Government uh, announced yesterday that they would offer uh, 500,000 uh, Japanese yen, which is approximately uh, 4,500 US dollars for a voluntary closure, but uh, only to small and medium-sized businesses, so not to a large business. Well, this is quite understandable, thinking of the budget constraint and also uh, public uh, antipathy to helping large businesses uh, when everyone is suffering. But um, this means that a large business uh, might uh, prioritize their pecuniary interest. And uh, such thing actually happened in March uh, when the government was not, uh, has, has not declared the state of emergency yet. So there was a large, a large uh, sport event, which is called K1 Grand Prix. Uh, and this was held on March 22nd when everyone started to worry about COVID-19. And, and the local government uh, requested uh, the organizers to cancel the event, but they did not offer compensation uh, because it was not um, legalized, well, which, which was not, uh, which was because, um, not a, which was a voluntary uh, decision. And they thought that it might not be fair to compensate this single event organizer. And so after all, uh, the event organizer decided to carry on the event, which gathered uh, surprisingly more than 6,000 people in this time. So um, if we can put aside budget issues, and I believe we, maybe it's possible uh, if we can finance this, then uh, I think that it makes sense uh, for the public uh, to compensate uh, business for their loss so that they can incentivize uh, the businesses to internal, internalize a negative externality. But um, the, another issue is then, should we compensate uh, businesses in case of a lockdown, which is a mandatory measure uh, to force businesses close? But in this case, uh, at least from the perspective of incentives, then this is not necessary because they are anyway forced. But then the difficult question is how we should draw a line and how we should uh, differentiate um, when the businesses are compensated and not. So uh, let me just stop here and give the floor back to you, Okrio, and uh, I'm looking forward to the discussions. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Professor Koto uh, explained why more restrictive measures contained by the sanctions are not feasible in Japan. So uh, maybe the closing business uh, inevitably depends on the uh, company's voluntary adoption of the measure. So maybe here is the, uh, the CSR system, uh, which is closely related to focusing much at this point. Right? So how can we come up with a reasonable solution? Uh, Professor Goto, uh, Professor Goto, uh, uh, suggested, uh, pointed out the two uh, major issues. So on, one is a business, uh, business judgment tool and one is uh, using the taxpayer's money. So I open the discussion to the floor so, uh, about the CSR. So is there any uh, questions or comments on the two, uh, on the two presentations? Uh, Professor 
Chun Hyuk Chung, uh, you raise your hand. Uh, no, uh, I, 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 I didn't. Ah, you didn't. So what, what is the checkpoint of this? I mean, Uh, any anybody is on this point? May I speak now? Yep. Okay. And um, well, when I heard about heard the uh, Gengoto's presentation, my impression was that the my presentation uh, thought about the ex anti preparation of the externalities and. The problem about the ex ante preparation was that you tend to uh, estimate the loss uh, too little because the frequency, estimated frequency, is very low. And gathering itself might become ex negative externality kind of idea is a very difficult one to imagine ex ante. And uh, to the contrast, uh, at the ex post situation, you are suddenly in the situation that the gathering itself is the risk for the corporation, and then uh, suddenly it's very uh, difficult to continue the business. And in that state, uh, Professor Gengoto suggested that to incentivize, uh, it might be one measure to give them the taxpayers money uh, to help them shut down but um, if that uh, kind of normal negative externalities it is not the right idea and if this kind of the ex negative ex externality is a special one then it is also not the good idea to give them the expectations uh, they might be given compensations in the future. Uh, they have to like have the expectation that they are they will be given the compensation at the initial uh, initial time. But for the Japanese government is still in the discussion that they are they might be giving money or not be giving money in the future. Then the it might be. Uh, a bad incentive for the corporations because they are not, uh, they, they have the uh, kind of uh, moral hazard and, and uh, decide after the government decided their attitude toward giving taxpayers money. Uh, thank you. This is uh, not a very uh, kind of good comment, but this is my impression. Thank you very much for uh, comments. Uh, maybe uh, uh, the, uh, Dan, Dan, are you here? Dan, wait, you, uh, you, uh, yes, you, you raise your, oh, oh, sorry, you raise your hand, right? Yes, can you hear me? Okay, okay, thank you very much. And please, please join us and please briefly introduce your name and affiliation. Yeah, uh, I'm Dan Pochniak from the National University of Singapore. Um, I just had a, a question um, for uh, Gen Goto. Um, I, I realize that the way the law is now, it may be very difficult um, or, or impossible, for instance, to have shareholder meetings uh, without physical attendance. Um, and also, it's quite interesting what you said um, about the limits on the government's authority right now to shut down um, businesses. But you're, you know, around the world, and, and I'm just bringing in the Singapore experience here, you see that parliaments now are, are getting into uh, passing legislation extremely quickly. So for instance, in Singapore, and I believe this has been done in a number of other jurisdictions, they've recently changed the shareholder meeting laws to allow um, uh, for virtual meetings uh, to deal with this. And I'm just wondering if you think that the COVID-19 crisis will um, uh, change the pace of legal reform in Japan. Uh, do, do you see um, the parliament stepping in um, and, and passing things very quickly to allow for things, uh, for instance, uh, the hurdle that you mentioned 
with virtual meetings or even to go further in terms of lockdown. I understand the lockdown is probably more politically contentious, but um, I wonder if the AGM would be contentious. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Oh, uh, so may, may I respond to the two comments? Yep, yep. Okay. Uh, okay. Uh, so thank you, Dan, and thank you, Professor Matsui, for your comments and questions. So, uh, so let me start with answering Dan's questions, which seems to be an easier one. So, um, so yeah. well, I, yeah. Uh, so, I, I have noticed that many countries, like uh, Germany, has in. Uh, oh, okay. I will start my video. Is it good? Okay, yeah. So, um, so like for example, Germany has passed a special act to uh, to uh, let the companies uh, skip uh, physical gathering uh, this year. Well, you know, well, I just envy them. <laughs> well, Japanese government and parliament it seems to be much slow, <laughs> slower. And uh, well, uh, at least for AGMs, um, the Ministry of Economy and Ministry of Justice, they have issued a joint guidance saying that um, there, you need to have a physical gathering, but it is still valid uh, even if no shareholder physically shows up. And uh, all votes can be mailed in and you can advise shareholders, please not come, don't come. <laughs> <laughs> so this is, and this is, uh, I'm not sure whether this is really true or not. Oh, but uh, actually we had a similar issue when we had a earthquake nine years ago. And then uh, we, the government also issued that actually the, the law requires to have a uh, AGM uh, within three months after the end of the business year, but well, maybe you can extend a bit. So Jap Japanese government seems to choose a way of uh, not changing the law, but uh, dealing with in a uh, more subtle manner. And, but this cannot be applied to, for example, introducing lockdown. Right. And so, yeah, unfortunately, this seems to be not changing uh, Japanese registration and the administrative system. Thank you. Okay, yeah. And, um, and also, um, and thank you to Professor Matsui for raising the issues that I haven't been clear enough. Clear enough. Um, so yes, uh, this is a concern that, so how maybe it makes sense to compensate the businesses right now for this COVID crisis, but um, this shouldn't be applied to all kinds of externalities. And um, well, one thing is that for example, uh, let's take uh, climate change. And maybe this, well, of course, this is a serious uh, crisis for the arts in the long run, but uh, there's still time of uh, introducing direct regulation. And we, we do not decide, we do not need to decide this in a day or week. So this is a big um, difference. But then uh, even for this pandemic, um, unfortunately, this kind of pandemic could happen maybe in 10 or 20 years again. And so it is important to uh, deal with the moral hazard issue raised by Professor Matsui. And well, I do not have an answer here. Um, maybe we can learn from this uh, crisis and if Japan goes on to uh, introduce some kind of lockdown, lockdown in a limited manner, maybe it's a better way to proceed. And then uh, if we introduce lockdown, then um, as I have mentioned, to incentivize the businesses, uh, we do not need to compensate. So at least we, this is kind of a one-time solution and should not be the norm. And, uh, and may I also pick up the question uh, raised by, uh, I'm, I'm not sh uh, sure whether he, this is he or she, but uh, by uh, Dr. Uh Kamana. Yeah, Kamalna. Yeah. Yeah, so maybe should we give the floor to this person? Uh, yeah. well, uh, just uh, just uh, she, re um, she, he or she may raise the question. So yeah, so it's in the it's in uh, the Q and A box, so maybe. Just respond. 
Okay, all right. Okay, so I will just respond and maybe uh, he or she Hello? can take the floor if that's enough. Or can, can you hear me? Oh, uh, yeah, sure. Yes. Oh, please. thank you. The, uh, that was a good, interesting discussion. I just want uh, uh, to add, if you said there'll be less discretion with the business judgment rule, mm -hmm. but in cases where directors actually balance out continuing to operate with appropriate safety measures, do you think courts should actually uh, take away the business judgment rule cover? Okay, yes, yeah. uh, thank you for this question. Yeah, so uh, uh, I, yes, I think, uh, so I, my point was that business judgment rule should be uh, in place to some extent, uh, not in the full form, but it shouldn't be taken away completely. So uh, yes, I agree that um, business should be able to op co continue operation with safety measures, but then the question is uh, whether their safety measures were enough or not. So um, this, well, and I'm not a specialist on this um, pandemic uh, um, response, so I don't know. But uh, so maybe the similar thing applies to, for example, uh, like cybersecurity issues. So you need to, you know that there's a risk. So you need to um, introduce some safety measures, but no one knows for sure that what is enough. So, and, and if the risk is uh, very high, or very large, then sometimes the sensible solution is just to, you know, refrain from uh, operating. Right. So thank yeah. you. So yeah. And another thing that's uh, so the and also uh, in addition to like continuing uh, the shops and other things, uh, another issue we have in Japan right now is that uh, well you might have seen in some news media, but Japanese people are still commuting. And well, luckily, universities decided to uh, do everything online. But uh, regular workers, uh, some people still need to go to office um, because of some valid reasons. Uh, for example, they uh, are working in construction or, or sometimes they're, they are in legal department, which uh, for uh, cybersecurity reasons, uh, they need to go to office to have a paper documents. So, but uh, this means that Japanese uh, companies were uh, not prepared enough to work from home. And uh, this goes back to the BCP issue raised by Professor Matsui. Yeah. So, yeah, so another thing is that um, maybe companies or directors can be protect protected by their decisions to continue business now but then their uh, decision or their kind of uh, non-action to not to prepare enough for these kind of issues can be questioned. Sure, it's really interesting, thank you. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. So uh, any other comments or questions? Hi, this is John Moon from Korea University. Okay. Hello, everyone. Uh, thank you, Professor Koto and Professor Matsui for uh, interesting uh, presentations. Uh, I would like to uh, add a comment. Uh, and uh, I think it's very interesting that uh, Professor Koto uh, defined uh, CSR as kind of a mitigating negative externalities. And uh, that reminded me uh, of you know, the Coase theorem, right? Uh, the Ronald Coase uh, said that uh, when there is externality, uh, it could be internalized uh, and possibly lead to an efficient outcome uh, if two conditions are met, right? Uh, the first one is the property right is well-defined and assigned. Uh, and the second thing is transaction cost is not very high. Uh, and the property right issue uh, is related uh, to the compensation issue Professor Goto mentioned, right? Uh, so whether the businesses have the right to you know, open and you know, earn uh, profit, or uh, the citizens or the government uh, has the right for public safety. So uh, in those conflicts, uh, the social consensus should be clearly assigned. Uh, that's the condition uh, for the property right definition and assignment uh, so that this kind of externality uh, could be internalized efficiently. 
Uh, and the transaction cost issue is, of course, you know, this is kind of a black swan uh, event with extreme uncertainty. Uh, and that raises uh, transaction costs significantly. Uh, and in that regard, uh, I'm kind of pessimistic about, you know, uh, these kind of private solutions uh, like CSR uh, could lead to uh, a socially efficient outcome. Uh, and uh, in that regard, uh, I would like to raise an interesting uh, case from an American company, Patagonia. Uh, I think everyone's familiar with the company. Uh, and when uh, the COVID-19 outbreak took place, uh, Patagonia announced that it would close down all American store outlets, uh, including the online outlets, uh, while paying uh, for their employees uh, for their regular pay. So uh, that is certainly a great uh, gesture. You could uh, call that uh, a CSR. Um, but you know, that is partly possible because you know, one, Patagonia is a very successful company, uh, but two, uh, it is also a private company. So uh, you know, they didn't need to call for the shareholders uh, general meeting or uh, needed their approval uh, to go through these kind of measures. Uh, and that uh, is an example of a company with low transaction cost uh, structure. Uh, they could uh, respond much quickly uh, much more quickly uh, and possibly uh, decisively uh, in responding to these kind of uh, events. So uh, those are uh, my comments uh, to uh, your excellent presentations. Thank you. And uh, thank you very much, Professor Miyajima, and then uh, can go to the response. Okay. Professor, uh, Professor Miyajima? Yes, um, can you hear me? I, yes, uh, so thank you so much for an uh, interesting uh, presentation for uh, both of our presenters. And uh, I'd like to ask a very uh, quick uh, question to uh, Dan Goto. And now the uh, situation in Japan is uh, based on a private uh, incentive uh, for coping with this situation. And uh, very uh, naive and simple question for current situation. Uh, so if we if you will be asked uh, under the business uh, decision rule, uh, so uh, suppose that company has a lot of uh, urgent work and the company uh, asks to employee uh, to come to a uh, company and do um, an emergent job. As a result, he uh, will be infected. And then uh, employee uh, later on uh, criticized to a company uh, to require uh, this guy uh, to uh, do uh, uh, this job. Then a uh, company will be involved uh, in uh, some uh, serious court uh, trouble. So in this case, uh, so a business decision rule uh, will protect the uh, top manager uh, to have done uh, this kind of decision. So that's the first question. And the second question is, uh, the given this situation, job uh, that the employee be required is some dangerous. So a uh, company decided uh, to give some extra money for doing uh, this kind of uh, very uh, dangerous job. But it's obviously, uh, reduce the profit or uh, increase the cost and uh, opposed to uh, shareholders. So that the appropriate level of extra money uh, to this kind of a dangerous job is always a problem. And uh, this is also under the uh, business decision rule and the top manager is uh, under current situation, his decision will be relatively uh, guaranteed uh, by uh, this business decision rule. And that's my question. Thank you. Koto, uh, Professor Koto, uh, yeah, you have two comments and uh, questions, and so can you respond? It? Okay, uh, thank you so much for uh, your questions and comments. Um, well, I think both were related to business judgment rule, uh, which is quite a legal <laughs> issue. Well, uh, so 
Yeah, so uh, let me just start with uh, Professor Moon's quest, uh, comment. Uh, yes, I, I perfectly agree that this is actually uh, one possible application of course theorem. And uh, well, for property light issues, I think it, uh, well, in, in Japan's uh, current situation, companies have a right to operate. Uh, it's just up to their decision. It's a voluntary measure. And so, we, um, so we, that's why I uh, raise the issue of compensation. And, um, and also, then the, you also raise the issue of uh, the example of Patagonia closing down voluntarily. Which is I, I also had the news, and I think it was a great decision. Uh, um, and yes, it to be it was much sim uh, easier to do this because they are a private closed company. And but uh, also for um, public companies, uh, you know, sometimes public companies uh, take corporate social responsibility seriously and make some decisions. And um, and actually, the second question raised by Professor Miyajima uh, is also the same thing. So can um, public company pay extra money to employees uh, for to compensate for their risk of being infected, and I think both I think so to closing down their shops uh, while paying uh, employees or paying extra money to employees. Uh, these are both business decisions, and taking the current situation into consideration, I think these decisions would be protected um, by business judgment rule. Because you know, um, for example, um, uh, taking your Patagonia example, um, then uh, I think one consideration for them was uh, their reputation. So, uh, in to uh, and also reputation uh, for taking customers' health seriously and also taking the welfare of the employees seriously. And well, for Patagonia customers, I think this counts uh, a lot. So uh, I think they just um, compared this repetition issue and paying, well, I'm not sure uh, whether they expected that this crisis was gonna continue for this long, but uh, I think this was kind of a business judgment to you know, um, put much more on repetition. And also same thing applies for the Professor Museum's second question. Uh, so to retain skilled employees or talented employees and to incentivize them to uh, commit to their work, uh, it, you know, it makes sense to give extra money. The d difficult question is the amount, but this, this is not uh, you know, specific to this current station. And then, um, and also the first question of Professor Miyajima, uh, so can uh, would directors be liable to employees who uh, have been infected because they had to commute to their work? Well, um, well, my simple answer is actually, this is not a corporate law question, but rather a labor law question. <laughs> so, uh, and I think uh, the companies and also directors owe duties to their employees to uh, take care of their health and to reduce their risk. So maybe, yes, this employees would, and this could be a real, um, in, in, in Japan that some of companies might be sued for um, exposing employees to their risk, to a risk. And, but this uh, would be first be paid by companies. And then the uh, directors could be sued by shareholders or the company itself for uh, taking this, uh, pursuing this risk, uh, which uh, in the, resulted in a lawsuit from employees. And if this um, result in a huge amount of suits, then this could be an issue. And this uh, is actually the situation that I was uh, thinking of when I raised the business judgment rule issue. So if the company goes on uh, with their business open and this um, results in the infection of employees or customers, so there could be a huge risk of lawsuit. And, um, this might not be protected by business judgment rule if the court thinks that actually there was a huge risk and comp uh, directors should have been more carefully considering uh, taking these into consideration. So these are my short answers and thank you. So the floor back to you, Okriel. Yes, thank you very much. And we have one other uh, questions from the floor. So uh, uh, Akira, Akira Dokutsu, Akira Dokutsu, can you 
Do you hear me? Uh, yeah. Yeah, can you? Thank you. Uh, yeah, thank you. Can you hear me? Yeah. Ah, thank you. So, I'm Akira uh, 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 from Tohoku University in Japan, Sendai. So, I would like to ask uh, the budget problem to gain. So, budget problem relating to compensation. Can government, in, ah, Gen said uh, compensation is uh, difficult because of uh, budget. But I think so, government can increase money supply for compensation. That could lead inflation, but it uh, means internal, 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 internalizing the cost for compensation or cost of shutdown of shop or business into all beneficiaries. Is it possible or impossible because of the covenant of government bond or something? I, I'm sorry, I do not know uh, macroeconomics or financial theory at all. Okay, uh, so shall I respond? Uh, so thank you, Akira, for this question. Yeah, yes, uh, so I, I'm uh, just, as you know, uh, I am also not a specialist in macroeconomics or finance theory or public financing, but uh, yes, uh, so I was thinking uh, that um, financing uh, this compensation should be possible um, because this is, uh, you know, just as you mentioned, this will benefit everyone in the in Japan, in the country, and so this should be, um, well. This could be uh, financed either by raising tax, as actually Japan Japanese government did raise tax to finance the compensation or support financial support to the victims of. Um, of the Great Eastern Japan earthquake and the Fukushima nuclear power plant crisis. So it's actually the same thing, but the only difference is uh, that the money would go not to the victims, but to the businesses. And this might uh, have some public opposition, but uh, it could be possible. And the other way is to issue gov uh, additional government bonds or um, just uh, not issuing for money, but just giving government bonds for free to these businesses, uh, which has been done uh, to give financial support to Tokyo Electric Power Company uh, for their uh, you know, recovery from the crisis. So yeah, I think it could be possible, but it's all up to the political decisions. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, well, it's time uh, to move. Uh, time to move on to the second session. So, as uh, Professor uh, Tomoe, uh, Professor Matsui uh, pointed out, the uh, the problem of TSR is not only the problem between the uh, between the shareholders and stakeholders, but also the problem between the stakeholders. So, I think in May's, you know, the problem is more difficult. So. We need more discussions. And so thank you very much for Professor Matsi and Professor Goto uh, and all participants uh, from the discussions and from the floor. So that the second session uh, will be moderated by Professor uh, Tomita Fujita from uh, University of Tokyo. So Professor Fujita, are you here? Uh, can you hear me? Yep, yep. Okay, uh, yep. Thank, you for, uh, thank you, Professor Song. So, let us continue the second part of the of this session. <clears throat> In the second session, we have two speakers from Korea. And first, uh, we have Professor Chan uh, at uh, Seoul National University. And he will give, a, give us the presentation on the COVID-19 pandemic as a material adverse change, the issue of risk allocation and the sales of share, uh, sales of share transaction. So Professor Chan, please. Um, hi, everyone. Um, my name is Kyung Chan, and I'm teaching corporate law and commercial law at Seoul National University. Um, my talk is titled The COVID-19 Pandemic as a MAC. The MAC stands for Material Adverse Change, and it is a legal jargon uh, widely used in um, the corporate transactions. So compared to other topics of this marathon webinar, um, this may sound a bit too technical, but I think it is practically uh, important issue 
that warrant an analysis in this era of pandemic. So um, let me um, share my slide with you. And I'll walk you through to this um, seemingly um, technical subject. So I see my slide. Okay. Um, yes. Um, the here is the uh, background. In a corporate transaction like M and A, signing the contract is uh, far from the end of the transaction. You need a substantial um, time gap between the signing and the closing. Um, to obtain the government approval or waiting period for the antitrust to review and arranging the acquisition financing and so on. So there are a lot of um, the signed but not yet closed deals around the globe. So COVID-19 pandemic caused um, serious uh, negative effects, not only on the general uh, economic situations, but also um, the business finance of, of the target company itself. So um, in, such a, in such a case, um, the, should the buyer still comply with the original contract or can the buyer walk away from the deal? So um, there's a, it is a legal question that whether the buyer can legitimately refuse to close the deal uh, when the unexpected events such as uh, pandemic take place? That is the question that I try to answer. Um, and the another question is that whether that kind of answer will remain the same for each uh, different jurisdictions. And what would be the impact of such disputes or debates on the corporate law practice going forward? So um, the MAC or the material that was changed plays a few functions in the corporate transactions. The relevant one here is uh, the function as a closing condition. So typically, the non-existence of MAC in the target company is a condition to the buyer's obligation in the m and transaction. In, for example, credit facilities, um, the non-existence of MAC and the borrower's ability to repay is a condition to drill down. So in many transactions, a buyer can walk away if there's a MAC in the target, which we call so-called MAC out. So the, the function of the MAC provision is the allocating the pre-closing risk to sellers and provide incentive to them to maintain the appropriate level of investment in the target company. In other words, the um, MAC provision places the responsibility on the seller to ensure that no adverse change will um, take place in the, in the company. So in other words, it addresses uh, the possible problem of the moral hazard by the sellers. So um, um, the broader MAC will grant broader discretion on the side of the buyer uh, to walk away, to refuse to close the deal. So generally, the, bu generally the buyers prefer a broader uh, MAC provision, while the sellers prefer narrow or even no uh, MAC provision. That's the basic um, the situation in uh, the legal the transactions. Then um, can the buyer make out um, by the reason of the COVID-19? I saw many memoranda on this issue prepared and circulated by many elite law firms in US and UK. And all of them basically say that, look at the wording of the contract. It depends on the contract wording. So, then, then the, what the contract generally uh, look like on this issue. The MAC provision has two parts. The main body 
um, define the Mac usually like this. So with respect to the uh, target company, any event, circumstances, development, or change that is materially adverse to business. And often, especially in the United States, there are cop-outs. Any of the following does not constitute MAC. Um, they are the general political, economic, or business conditions or changes, general financial or market conditions, and outbreak of a war, terrorism, pandemic, epidemic. And in some cases, there's an exclusion to this curve out. That is, unless it has any disproportionate effect on the target company. So even if it is a kind of general change in the atmosphere, uh, if it has disproportionate effect on the target company, then it can still constitute uh, the MAC. So the uh, can buyer MAC out in case of pandemic based on this um, the typical language of MAC provision. As I said, uh, the answer would um, depend on the wording. So with the, uh, if there's a carve out for external conditions, then then um, the, it would not constitute a MAC. And so the buyer would not easily MAC out um, based on such reasons. Um, in such a case, the buyer should recharacterize such a disastrous event as a firm specific event, the company specific event, or an event that disproportionately affected the target because the, uh, the general change or general financial condition or outbreak of pandemic that affects uh, every company proportionately would not constitute the, the, um, the MAC when there's a cop out. But without cop outs, if there's a no cop outs in the contract, then there's a better chance for Mecca. Um, what I want to be highlight uh, is that there are some differences among jurisdictions. The cobots are widespread, relatively more widespread in United States. Um, there's a recent Delaware case on MAC issue, um, the Akron case um, in 2018. It says that the typical MAC clause allocates general market or industry risk to the buyer and company specific risk to the seller. That means uh, this decision itself assumes um, the existence of the carve-outs. And uh, many of uh, the law firm's memorandum that I mentioned also assumes the existence of the uh, curve outs. And according to Professor, Professor um, David of Solomon, the long list of curve outs became typical practice among the US lawyers since around 2000. But in Japan, according to uh, Professor Fujita, you're uh, the MA. Um, the, the treaties <laughs> published in 2018. It seems like the carve-outs are not typical in Japan. And also I saw the uh, one, uh, the, the, the article by um, Mr. Um, Iwazaki, uh, and his paper also says that. And that is uh, the similar in Korea. And in EU, I don't have the uh, very detailed statistics, but I found a report that said that uh, around 56% of the agreements surveyed in that report had carve outs. And also there are some reports that many acquisition agreements in EU does not have MAC clause at all. But even there's a no MAC clause um, in EU, some remedies are available in civil jurisdiction. For example, the uh, principles of the European contract law acknowledges the concept of changing circumstances, so which is a clausula rebus extendibus, um, which allows a party to the contract to terminate or reshape the contract if there's any fundamental change in the circumstances. And also 
in, in, in for example, in German civil code, they have um, these so-called the uh, the the Stern, their uh, case of security target, the interference with the basis of the transaction, which also grants some um, room for terminating the contract when there is a, a fundamental change in in the circumstances. So, what is what is the expected impact of uh, these um, disputes or debates? Um, there will be a lot of disputes. The buyers will try to escape their contractual commitment in this uh, time of uh, pandemic. And sellers will struggle to hold the buyers to their words. So for example, in US, there were a lot of uh, MAC disputes in around 2001, around the 9-11, and the financial crisis in 2007 and 8. Um, most of them were not brought to the court, but some of them were disputed in front of the court, and there are some written rulings on these cases. However, generally speaking, whether or not there is a cop out, the courts in every jurisdiction will not easily allow MAC out. That's my uh, um, kind of um, presumption. Generally, the court um, tend to honor the contract and require the compliance with the contract and not easily respect the buyer's remorse. So the more likely result is that the parties will have to renegotiate and achieve settlement. They may agree that the buyer walk away after paying some amount of uh, breakup fees or simply they may agree to reduce the price or adjust the price uh, the contract terms. But of course, um, of course, the, uh, the how uh, the back clause is de defined or drafted in the contract will affect the leverage of each party uh, has in their renegotiation. So what will happen to the, uh, the m and practice? Um, one possibility is that um, since the, the, the MAC became an important issue, the, the one possibility is that the parties will agree to a clearer definition of MAC and carve outs, and even they will try to quantify um, the concept of MAC, like a certain percentage of uh, the reduction of a certain, certain percentage of their revenue, etc. Another possibility is that the parties may wish it to leave it in vague terms. They will kind of keep intentional vagueness in the contract. I'm uh, inclined to the kind of second scenario because here the key issue is who will bear the external risk that is beyond the control of either buyers or sellers. Pandemic such as COVID-19 is clearly beyond the control of either party. So um, it would be very hard to find any black and white solution. The, the parties, whether or not the, there is a um, clearly defined MAC clause, they would have to renegotiate and find an alternative solution instead of any party winning 100%. So then the parties may prefer vague wording, vague wording in their contract to leave a room for renegotiation and flexible solution of the dispute. So um, since this is a kind of um, unheard of uh, events, um, I think it will have huge impact on the legal theory as well as a legal practice. And this MAC issue is uh, seemingly um, technical, but I think it may be an important issue in many jurisdictions. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, uh, Professor Chan. Uh, well, uh, 
Professor Chan's uh, presentation is quite different issue compared with the former uh, presentations in the sense that uh, home, former sessions more uh, focuses on more or less the public versus private interest. But here we are discussing about the allocation of uh, risk among the contracting parties. So uh, I think uh, we do not need any well, summary because uh, well, uh, the presentation is very clear enough. So uh, I, wish, I wish to immediately open the, uh, open, uh, the floor. So do you have any question, comments or anything? to Professor Chan's presentation. Anyone? Uh, if not, uh, what do you, oh, oh. Uh, Lan Lan, uh, Lulu, yes, hi. Hello. Hi, uh, this is Lulu from uh, National University of Singapore. Yeah, thanks, uh, Professor Chun, for, for the very good uh, presentation. Uh, my question is, um, I think in, in Singapore, we talk more about force majeure clauses and frustration. So um, my question is, um, how does it interact with uh, MAC clause, in, in, in your opinion? Thank you. Um, thank you for your question. Uh, yes, I, as I briefly mentioned during my presentation, each jurisdiction has uh, very similar um, devices uh, for treating um, this kind of uh, fundamental changes that occur um, to the basic um, the circumstances of the contract. For example, uh, as I said, um, the European is the, the change of circumstance doctrine and force merger frustration and so on. The force merger and frustration is the, the doctrine developed mainly in, among the common law countries, while um, the change of circumstances or the Stern der Gesellschaftsgrundlage is a kind of developed from the German tradition. But um, I think basically um, there, the basic idea underlying these doctrines are more similar than different. Uh, because if uh, there's a fundamental changes to the circumstances that became the basis of their contracting, then um, there should be some changes to the, uh, the, the already agreed upon contract terms. So um, sometimes they will, um, be entitled to terminate the contract, or the, sometimes the contract should be reshaped. And depending on the jurisdiction, some jurisdictions are more focused on the reshaping the contract, and some jurisdictions um, um, pay more attention to whether the party may terminate the contract or not. But all in all, um, these are the separate um, mechanisms or devices to handle this uh, the problem. So. Um, the, the, the returning to your uh, question, um, the MACLUS, uh, the kind of the relation between the MACLUS and other doctrines like force merger and frustration, I think they are parallel. So um, the parties may argue that that, that event uh, constitutes force merger, whether it is uh, defined in their context or or not, and just uh, as a matter of the kind, kind of common law, or that may um, constitute frustration under the common law tra tradition, or that constitute uh, the other doctrines in the, the, the similar tradition. So um, depending on the, uh, the governing law of the contract and depending on the drafting of the contract, the party will resort to a different um, devices or remedies. But the, I think the basic idea underlying those disputes will be uh, more similar. Uh, any other question or comments? Uh, 
uh, you know what? Uh, can I ask one question to Professor Chan? Uh, you introduced that uh, the curve out is not common in Korea and, uh, and, and in Japan. And is there any hypothesis or explanation for this phenomenon? Or uh, the situation, is the situation changing? Well, because uh, even the United States curve out is not very common before financial crisis or 9-11. Uh, then after that event, well, they introduced a uh, curve out. So this is just a matter of time, maybe. So do you have any, what, what is your explanation of, your, of the difference? Yeah, uh, thank you for a um, great question. Actually, I'm curious about that as well. Um, the, uh, the, the, uh, first of all, there is a no um, the reliable um, statistics to or the survey result in Japan and Korea, right? Mm. In the United States, for example, um, many uh, SP, the, the stock purchase agreements are public documents. So there are a lot of uh, the data um, that can be surveyed. And the ABA um, periodically publishes the, the deal summary, right? But uh, that kind of uh, the data is not available in Japan and Korea in most in many other jurisdictions. So we do not have uh, which percentage of uh, the SBA contract of call outs or not. So having said that, um, um, I think uh, there may be some factors that may explain the absence of cow outs in uh, Korea and probably in Japan and probably in other EU, con EU countries. One is that generally speaking, the, the uh, the lawyers are uh, educated under the civil tradition, uh, don't incline to have a uh, too long <laughs> language in their contract. I have an experience yeah. as a, when I was practice the law, practice the law, I've experienced that the German clients sometimes ask us to draft the contract, not in the Anglo-Saxon lengthy style. <laughs> so pre, um, in many cases, uh, it um, is kind of affected by the general the drafting style. So they want to add so many um, caveats or the carve outs to the contract. But more important issue is that I think um, the, the, the change of circumstances doctrine, which, mm -hmm. is, uh, which has a kind of rooted in the, the civil tradition like uh, the Japanese law and Korean law and German law. I think that kind of way of thinking um, is uh, kind of influential to the, the practicing lawyers as well. So if there is uh, any um, unexpected but fundamental changes in the circumstances, then I think many civil, many lawyers are educated on the civil tradition may think that then the contracts should be um, I mean, the parties should be able to uh, adjust or terminate the contract. So um, probably that may have affected um, the non-existence of the cobalt. But as you said, that may change in the future as they did in the United States. Thank you. Uh, Professor Tare, uh, do you have any question or comments? One quick question. I enjoyed the presentation a lot, so thanks. Um, one thing that often comes up with uh, material adverse effect provisions in, in the U.S. is their interaction with other uh, closing conditions and covenants so, uh, yep. and, and, and other potential options. So, for instance, uh, there may be a, a trade-off or maybe some complementarity between an MAE provision and a reverse termination fee where the buyer can walk away but pay a, pay a break fee in doing so or in closing conditions that are tied to financing, right? There are certain things that may cause a dramatic upheaval in financial markets. The buyer can't get financing. And even if they can't walk away because of the MAE, the fact that they weren't able to get financing functions as the equivalent of, of an MAE. What's your sense in sort of scanning, uh, scanning contracts outside of the US, uh, in East Asia, the, the complementarity amongst these various types of provisions that might collectively function 
as a type of a material adverse effect provision in addition to the to the tailored or the specific one. Thanks a lot. Um, thank you. Uh, this is an um, excellent question. Um, just the, uh, due to the time limit, I couldn't explain fully about the other um, the various um, kind of contractual devices in the standard m and contract, but as Professor Telly um, pointed out, there are many other um, kind of uh, provisions or clauses um, that may help the buyer to walk away from the contract. Um, there are, for example, the financing out, so-called, the financing out, or there may be another, um, the, the country of the devices like a break of fee or reverse break of fee. Um, the, based on, um, I, I, I'm, I'm not familiar with uh, the current practice of the United States, uh, the, 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 the merger contracts, um, but based on my um, the limited knowledge on the Korean uh, the transaction documents, um, the financing out is not the typical. The financing out is not typically accepted by the counterparty in the course of the negotiation. Um, but the so-called the backdoor um, MAC, which is that the the, the non-existence of the MAC is a part of the reps and warranties. So um, the, the existence of the MAC may uh, also result in um, the, 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 the MAC outright um, through the reps and warranty provisions, so-called the backdoor um, the MAC. This is uh, quite um, widespread in the, for example, the, the, the M&A practices in Korea. So in that case, um, those uh, provisions or devices will be kind of collectively um, used or invoked um, by the buyer. And um, the, this is related to Fuji, Professor Fujita's previous question, um, the, is that uh, one of the reasons that the MAC um, provision in Korea is uh, not very um, detailed is that these situations uh, um, are uh, recently um, handled by the break of fees and reverse break of fees in Korean practice. In many Korean M&As, um, there are the, the special arrangement about the break of fees or reverse break of fees. So any termination issue of the uh, contract is um, treated um, as a matter of uh, the break of fees or the reverse break of fees. So yes, um, these old devices will be um, invoked um, by the buyer who wishes to escape from their uh, contractual commitment. And finally, it will end up the renegotiation uh, either um, in the court or out of the court. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, well, uh, the all uh, relevant provisions uh, should be taken into account uh, together, and the combination might be different by jurisdiction by the, uh, jurisdiction. So uh, it's 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 the research should be very well difficult uh, uh, in that sense. Well, uh, you have if you don't you, uh, if I may, I can take one more question from the floor. If not, uh, I wish to move on to the next topic. No questions? All right, uh, thank you very much for, uh, for uh, uh, thank you very much, uh, Professor Chan. And let us move on to the next uh, uh, topic. Uh, next speaker is uh, Professor Wu Chan Kim. Uh, he talks about COVID-19 and family succession. That's the most very uh, interesting uh, title. So please uh, speak, uh, Professor Kim. Okay, uh, thank you for your introduction. I hope you can hear me. 
Um, so this is uh, going to be different from what other speakers have been talking about. Uh, I'm going to talk about family succession, um, you know, a very traditional uh, topic in corporate uh, governance. Um, so let me just uh, start off by sharing my slide. Okay, um, I hope you can see this. All right, uh, so let me uh, begin. Um, so um, because of the crisis, um, many people actually uh, died, they're sick, uh, people lost their jobs, uh, and some kids are even starving. And the economy is uh, falling apart. And uh, this is reflected in the uh, share price, as you can see. Uh, this is Cosby Index, uh, a market-wide uh, index for the Korea exchange. Uh, before the endemic, pandemic, uh, it was way above 2000 level, 2240. Uh, as of January 21st, that's when the, the first infection took place in Korea. It went all the way down to 1,458. Uh, that's a 35% drop in the, the share price. It is recovering a little bit, but that was a dramatic uh, fall in the share price. Uh, but despite all this, in the midst of all this, there are people who are actually benefiting from this lower uh, share price. And they are the sons and daughters of the current business group chairman. I'm talking about the family control business groups in Korea. Uh, Excuse me, Uchen. Yes. Oh, I'm so sorry to interrupt. Uh, it seems that your slides have been not been shared. Oh, really? All right. So let me. Okay. So hold on. Okay. Sorry about that. Yeah. No problem. Yeah. I guess you can see now. Yeah. Right? Now it's good. Thank you so much. All right. Sorry about that. Okay, uh, so I was on this slide. I just showed you that the share price has been falling uh, apart. Uh, I, I showed you this slide already. But there are people who are benefiting from this situation, and they are going to be the sons and daughters of the current business group chairman. I'm um, talking about the Korean Chebols family control business groups. Uh, why is that? Because of the tax rate in Korea. If you receive a gift from your parent, or if you inherit a fortune from your parent, uh, the current Korean tax code says the tax rate is 50%. And on top of that, uh, given the control premium uh, uh, enjoyed by the controlling family, uh, there's an adjustment factor of 20%. So the actual uh, de facto tax rate is 60%. So if you inherit, uh, receive a gift from your father, you give 60% uh, to the government and you get only 40. So the essence of family succession in Korea, if you want to have enough shares to control the business group afterward, you want to make sure you save tax payment. You want to minimize your tax payment. And the way to do that is to make use of the time when the share prices are at the bottom, when it's very low. So I'm going to share with you uh, three uh, cases that took place recently. Uh, the cases that are making use of the current situation where when the share prices are low. Uh, one is from uh, a very large uh, bakery chain company in Korea, SPC. Uh, this is the one that is running uh, Paris Baguette and Croissant. Uh, so the father, uh, you know, gifted, uh, gave a gift, a stock gift to their uh, son. And the son is, uh, you know, saving tax. I'll go through that. The second case is another very interesting case. Uh, it involves the Lee family of the CJ group. Uh, it's a re-gifting case. Uh, they originally uh, gave a gift, they cancel and they're giving it again. Why? Because they want to make use of the lower share price. And then uh, there's a chemical company, uh, a business group called OCI. And this is not a gifting case, it's a merger case. Uh, but when it comes to merger, merger, merger ratio, the swap ratio is very important but uh, they are making use of the situation to make sure that one company is lowly valued while the other company is not so that it could benefit uh, the family. Uh, so let me go through uh, the first case, SPC group. Uh, it's the Her family, the Her family. And it's a very simple uh, stock gifting case. Uh, and the company involved is the SPC Somnik company. And before I go into details, I, uh, I need to explain uh, some uh, tax regulation. Uh, whenever the father gives a gift to the son or the daughter in the form of stocks, uh, the, the important point is how to value the stock. And if it is a stock that is of a company that is publicly traded, 
uh, you're going to make use of the market share price, but not on the day of the uh, announcement, the gift announcement, but four months around the date of the gift. So the announcement took place in April 8, which means that you have to uh, get all the closing prices two months before and afterward, and you just compute the simple average, right? So if you take a look here, uh, the share price of this company, SPC Sumnet, was 82,701 uh, before COVID-19, but afterward, uh, around the time, well, to be exact, uh, April the 8th, that's when uh, the, the family announced the gift, uh, it went down a lot, and uh, you have to compute the four-month average, but I do not have the two-month average after April 8th, because uh, I cannot predict the share price. So if I just approximate using two months before, there's approximately 64,683. There's a gap here. And if you do calculate how much of a tax saving is enjoyed by the sun, it's around 3.6 million US dollars. It's a non-trivial amount. Uh, the share ownership uh, for the father, it fell from 9.27 to 4.64. The son went up from 11.68 to 16.31. But that's not the point. The point is how much tax uh, it saved. So there's nothing illegal about this, and you're free to do this. It's just the way the Korean uh, law is made. Right? But as, we, as I move on, uh, the cases are going to be complicated. And the very last case, the merger case that I will talk at the end, uh, actually hurts minority shareholders. And this is when it becomes a corporate governance a problem. Um, the second case is um, another uh, very interesting case. Uh, CJ Group uh, is in the food industry, entertainment industry. And uh, if I may give you the history a little bit, uh, last year of December, the father already announced that it will give a gift to uh, the son in the form of convertible preferred stock, it's trade in the market convertible preferred stock uh, that can be converted uh, later uh, into common stocks and make sure that the son will be able to have control. Um, at the time, the stock value was uh, evaluated to be 65,962. But with COVID-19, the share price uh, crashed. It went down all the way to like uh, 30,000 level. So uh, the father changed its mind. What he uh, did was he may use the option. He made use of the option to cancel the, uh, the gift. You can do that by Korean law. Uh, by March 31st, which is three months after uh, the end of the month that the gift was announced, uh, that's March 31st, uh, until then you can actually cancel the gift. And he actually did that. And next day, April 1st, he made an announcement to give the same gift to the same son but at a much lower price. Uh, we do not know the exact value of the share yet because it's a four month average, as I have told you, uh, but my uh, estimate is going to be uh, 56,000 something. Uh, there is a difference there. And if you do calculation, how much of a tax saving uh, that will be enjoyed by the sun, it's 9 million. So uh, it's increasing, right? Um, it was 3.6 million in case of SPC group. Now CG group, it's 9 million. Wait until the, uh, the very last case. Okay, this is the third case uh, involving OCI uh, Business Group, another very large uh, business group in uh, chemical industry. Uh, the company that I'm going to talk about is one of its member of company called Samguang uh, Glass, okay? Uh, before I do that, I want to uh, explain a little bit about uh, mergers in Korea, how mergers uh, takes place in Korea. Uh, when it comes to a merger, Valuing the company is very important. How valuable is the stocks of the companies that are going to go through the merger? Uh, this depends upon whether the company is a publicly traded company or it's a privately held company. For publicly traded company, you're going to make use of stock price, but not just one day share price, you're going to average three prices. Uh, the first one is the one month weighted average uh, before the announcement one week weighted average before the announcement and uh, the closing uh, price of the day just before the announcement. So, so you have three different prices and you average them. So in, in a sense, it's a weighted average uh, share price and uh, that's how uh, it's going to be valid for the publicly traded company. But for the privately held company, uh, there's no share price. So you're going to compute the weighted average of uh, DCF method valuation 
and the net asset value. Okay, so have that in mind. So this is uh, showing the common share price of Hamagang Glass. Like any other company, it crashed. It's much lower. But what they made use of is uh, not all the companies that were going to be merged were publicly traded. There was one company uh, that would be using the market share price for its valuation. Other firms are not going to use the market share price. So you're actually uh, valuing lowly the pu publicly traded firm. And by making use of the situation, uh, you can actually benefit your son and at the expense of outside minority shareholders. So um, the, the three companies that were involved is uh, Samgong Glass, uh, Kunjang Energy, and uh, E-Tech uh, Energy and uh, Engineering and Construction, three firm merger. Uh, and these are the ownership of the, the families, the father and the son. Uh, if you focus on Samgong Glass, the father owns a lot, 22%. The son owns less, six and 8%. But if you move on to Kunjang Energy, the sons hold a lot. Right? Together, there are two sons, 24%. And then E-Tech, uh, the father and son owns a little. And uh, the problem is the valuation method became different. Samgwan Glass is a publicly traded company, so you're using the market share price. On the other hand, Kunjang Energy is a privately held company, so you're going to make use of a weighted average of DCF and net asset value. E-Tech Engineering Construction is a publicly traded company, but just before the merger is going to be split, there, there's going to be a, a spin-off. And whenever there's a spin-off, because you cannot value a piece of a company, uh, again, it's going to be the weighted average of DCF and then asset value. So only one company will be making use of the uh, share price. And uh, they're doing this uh, using the merger ratio, which is right here. I'm showing you two different merger ratio. One is, uh, the one that they're actually doing, making use of the market price for Samgang Glass, uh, 2.54 and 3.88. This is the merger ratio that is not in favor of Samsung Glass, Samgang Glass, and it is in favor of Kunjang Energy. And by the way, E-Tech Engineering, because of the spin-off, became really small, so it's really marginal. So you can just ignore this uh, if you just want to focus on the big picture. It's basically between Kunjang Energy and Samgang Glass. But if you use net asset value instead of uh, the share price of Samgang Glass, the merger ratio would have been very different. So I did a simulation here. Uh, also, you have to get rid of all the treasure stocks, treasury stocks that will be created during the merger. Given that it does not have voting rights, if you do make adjustments, considering that everything um, after everything is done, the father will be owning 3.66%. Uh, is way down from 22%. The sons will be holding a lot. Uh, instead of six and 8% respectively, they'll be holding 20% and 80%. So this is same as the father giving gift to the son, right? But, and normally when th whenever there's a gift giving, uh, remember there was a 60% tax, right? Um, but however, because of this very unfavorable share price for Samgang Glass, uh, the family's benefiting, the sons are benefiting. If the family use the net asset value, so I'm showing you the second set of uh, ownership structure, that is what should have happened if they use the net asset value. But instead, uh, by making use of this low share price of some of glass, you can see that the ownership uh, structure is different. And if you do calculate how much of benefit the sons are getting, uh, they're getting 58 million US dollars of benefit. And if you multiply 60% to that, that's 40 million. So they are saving tax by $40 million. Um, so uh, that's, uh, uh, that's the end of my short presentation. So if I may just summarize, uh, what I said was uh, there are still people uh, in the midst of all this crisis. Uh, there are people who are benefiting from this situation. And this is, uh, I think, a loophole in the Korean regulation when it comes to uh, stock gifting and merger and the uh, policymakers should uh, pay more attention. And I would be really happy to hear uh, uh, feedback from uh, people from uh, outside of Korea, how uh, in their country they deal with these uh, uh, situations. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Professor Kim. Uh, well, it's a very interesting presentation. I didn't know such a thing is ha was happening in Korea. 
So uh, I think no uh, summary is necessary. The presentation is clear enough. So if you have any question and or comments, oh, uh, who raised the hand? Uh, uh, first, uh, uh, Misha, uh, Professor uh, Zhang Fun uh, Chan, uh, please uh, give your comments. Uh, yes, thank you very much. Um, um, yeah, I'm, I'm switching my video on. Okay, thank you. Okay. Yeah, so my name is um, Jun Hyuk Jung. Um, please call me Jun. I'm uh, an assistant pro professor in uh, Seoul National University Law School. So uh, thank you very much, Professor um, Wu Chan Kim, uh, who has um, shown uh, great examples on how controlling shareholders in Korea can use the uh, COVID-19 crisis as, as a good opportunity to expand their um, control over the, over the company in Korea. And uh, it's, I, I just wanted to add like um, to a, a few points on uh, other examples on, on how, how they can use this um, crisis as, as an opportunity. So uh, which is very interesting is that as uh, Professor Kim uh, has presented, um, since the breakout of the uh, COVID-19, foreign investors in Korea um, have sold their shares in, in the Korean stock market. And very interestingly, uh, retail investor, <coughs> me, for example, um, have been uh, very active in uh, purchasing shares in, in the uh, Korean uh, stock market. And I, I think that this has a very um, important two aspects in terms of um, corporate governance in Korea. So the first one would be that um, when you look back the uh, history of hedge fund um, uh, shareholder activism in Korea, it was um, mainly led by foreign um, institutional investors rather than uh, domestic um, funds. So, um, the fact that foreign uh, uh, institutional investors are, are selling their shares in, in, in Korean market means that I, I, I expect that the uh, hedge fund activism will slow down a little bit for a while. And, uh, and as, you, as you know, um, uh, like uh, largest um, Korean conglomerates have faced disputes or proxy contests with these hedge funds. So for example, Samsung has had uh, some dispute with Elliott, same with uh, Hyundai Motors, and also uh, SK uh, back to early uh, 2000, they also had some problem with the uh, foreign hedge funds. And maybe they can use um, this slowdown of um, their investment into Korea as an opportunity to get prepared themselves for the next um, activism. And the second interesting observation that I have is that um, since the uh, retail investors are purchasing shares in, in the Korean stock markets. Um, retail investors are of course less organized. They have like co coordination uh, problems and uh, they are less active in terms of uh, shareholder activism. And sometimes um, Korean retail investors are uh, patriotic. So um, if there's a dispute between a Korean conglomerate um, controlling family and foreign hedge funds while they were crit criticizing the, uh, the private benefit of control tunneling by uh, uh, Korean uh, controlling shoulders, like if there's a dispute with the uh, foreign institutional uh, investor, uh, there was a tendency that they were more supporting the uh, Korean conglomerates. So uh, summarizing uh, these two aspects, I, I think that um, COVID-19 is, uh, this may sound a little bit uh, counterintuitive, but it can be a good opportunity for uh, Korean controlling uh, families to reinforce their uh, influence in the company. And I am, I'm quite worried about the, uh, how uh, the minority shareholders in public companies would be um, affected by, by this. Thank you very much. Oh, yes, um, I fully agree uh, with uh, Professor Chung. Uh, I haven't thought about that part, but uh, it looks very possible. Yes. Uh, uh, Professor Kim, uh, uh, Jang Kyung Kim, uh, do you have any questions? Please. Yes. Please. Uh, okay. Just. Uh, Hello everybody, this is Jung Hyun Kim. I teach at Incheon National University. And thank you very much for your 
your presentation, Professor Kim, that I just want to add one point on Korean capital markets that the Korean government, the financial regulator, announced a policy to, to stabilize Korean stock market, which includes the temporary, which is six months ban on short selling, and the lifting of, of stock buyback limitation for listed companies. And these measures are set to target the, the retail investors, which who were mentioned in Professor Chung's comments, but maybe, and 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 maybe we we held the general election yesterday, and maybe this policy could have some impact on the succession process, in mentioned in Professor Kim's presentation. So just I just want to hear from from you about the Korean government policy toward the Korean capital market and 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 the 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 response from the corporations toward yeah, thank you okay so your question or comment uh was uh, Korean government policy uh the the capital market policy especially uh the stabilization policy and banning short selling or restricting short selling uh, does that have any implication uh, for Korean uh, business groups for their succession? Uh, is, is that your question? Oh, we can. Yes, this is my 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 comment. So. Oh, your comment. Okay. Uh, so I'm I'm sure uh, the Korean government did not really uh, have thought about a uh, family succession, but uh, maybe indirectly it would. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, uh, Professor Sang Yong Kan uh, uh, asking me uh, uh, the floor, uh, saying that he was uh, well. Uh, uh, he was assigned a uh, short talk on uh, bailout issue in pandemic. So uh, let us listen to him first, and then if there is a time, uh, we can discuss his presentation or Professor Kim's uh, presentation. After that, uh, Professor Khan's uh, uh, intervention. So, Professor Khan, please. Okay. Uh, thank you very much. I'm Sang Yap Khan from Peking University School of Transnational Law. Uh, I was assigned to discuss the pandemic uh, and the bailout. In the wake of the, oh, let me, uh, in the in the wake of In the wake of uh, the COVID-19 pandemic, many industries, including hotel and uh, aviation industries, have been hurt. Rescuing large corporations is a primary interest to the government due to the concern about massive layoff. It is noteworthy that in Korea and the countries dominated by controlling families, the government bailout would also lead to a consequence that the family control could be, at least in the short run, empowered or resuscitated. In this respect, the incumbent government, Korea, which has uh, made a lot of efforts to reform the controlling family regime, will likely encounter a dilemma. Also, in the case of a corporate bailout, it is noteworthy that the transfer of wealth will arise from taxpayers for rescued corporation and its shareholders. <laughs> Regarding the COVID-19 pandemic, the disruption of the global supply chain is one of the reasons for corporations' failure and the government's bailout. As a self-rescue plan, some business people in the world may be interested in setting up or reinforcing vertical integration. They may argue that a complex business organization, uh, organization with various business lines is more appropriate than a simple business organization focusing on a single business. If I use a, a law and economics terminology, these business people may claim that the scope of a firm should be expanded due to the higher transaction cost associated with 
the disruptive supply chain. Also, to attain st stabilized cash flows, business communities may be more interested in concepts of horizontal integration and corporate group, even if investors in the capital markets might not welcome diversified business organizations. Investors in the capital market play a crucial role in the domestic economy and politics. If the situation of the capital market exacerbates during the pandemic, the government may consider to prop up the stock market and bail out stock investors. To prop the stock market, for instance, the government might be tempted to use the National Pension Service, or in short, NPS. The NPS is a quasi-government agency and virtually all Korean citizens are its beneficiaries. If the NPS is mobilized to invest in the capital market to rescue stock market investors, particularly for the political purpose, the, purpo the transfer of wealth would arise from the entire citizen group namely the beneficiaries of the NPS who investors in the stock market. In this respect, the NPS agency problem will occur. Even in cases where the financial performance of the NPS is deteriorated by the bailout for investors in the stock market, the influence of the NPS in the domestic stock market would be strengthened due to the NPS purchasing of shares. If the political independence of the NPS is not secure, the reinforced law of the NPS will also likely to uh, lead to the question of the government engagement or interference in the listed companies. In terms of uh, market capitalization in Korea, uh, recently foreign investors accounted for almost 40%. If the pandemic is prolonged, foreign investors' capacity to invest in Korea will drop significantly. Also, the behavioral finance problem of the familiarity bias might be intensified and the global institutional investors will withdraw a significant amount of investment from Korea. In this case of the prolonged pandemic, the Korean stock market will face a severe downturn due to the prolonged pandemic and the withdrawal of foreign investment in the stock market. Under these circumstances, the government may have a strong incentive to bail out investors in the stock market. Another related issue here is when a significant portion of foreign investors leave Korea uh, during the pandemic, domestic retail investors would fill up the vacancy. In this case, due to the small, numerous shareholders, the collective action problem would become more serious in the shareholder activity. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Professor Kam. Uh, I wish to take one more question uh, from the floor, if you have any questions or comments, especially from the uh, participants from someone outside of Korea. Oh, Professor Miyajima, please. I can't hear you, Professor Miyajima. Sorry, can you hear me? Yes. Uh, yeah, uh, so I'm quite impressed uh, for uh, hearing from the uh, Korean uh, family succession, succession case uh, for utilizing uh, the, uh, the catastrophic uh, stock price uh, decline. And but the first question I'm Slightly uh, confusing is uh, the Professor Kim says that uh, family so hearted 
for uh, utilizing this uh, occasion, uh, family uh, may abuse their control right at the expense of minority shareholders. But in my impression, what happened in uh, Korean case is uh, utilizing the uh, business situation, and it's a matter of a market timing. So uh, stock price declined, and given the rule, uh, family has an uh, uh, opportunity to save uh, uh, tax. Uh, it seems that it. So compared to the case that the stock repurchase was done uh, utilizing the uh, company's top manager uh, using their private information and under the uh, uh, situation of under variation, company stock repurchased. And then uh, company stock was overvalued, then uh, this uh, treasury stock was reissued. In this case, it is true that the uh, top manager abused their uh, informational advantage uh, to the market. But this situation is uh, the whole stock market was declined. And given this situation, family used this situation for saving the money. So that uh, uh, it seems to me uh, a bit difficult to say uh, family abused their control power to save uh, their tax. So that's the one point. And the other point is the as for a third case, uh, you said that there is a, some regulatory loophole uh, for uh, this transaction, but uh, I, I cannot understand what is the main uh, loophole for uh, this uh, third case of a transaction. Thank you. Okay, uh, let me uh, quickly answer your two questions. The first one is, um, well, I, I went over three cases, right? So the first two cases are just stock gifting cases. Uh, that's, I showed you how they save tax. And this has, this is, has nothing to do with corporate governance issue. Uh, nobody's hurt. Well, the, the, the government is hurt because they collect less tax, but there's nothing illegal about it. They're just making the situation for the best interest of themselves. Um, corporate governance issue happens for the third case because there are two firms one is public, the other one is private. The public firm, I told you, they have to use a share price, but the share price is down, is way below the fundamental true value of the firm. But the private firm is using discounted cash flow method, uh, net asset value method, which has nothing to do with uh, the current share price. So one firm is overvalued while the other one is undervalued. And uh, the current company, uh, they could have decided to use net asset value for the publicly traded company, uh, but no company does that. Uh, they always use uh, this uh, market share price, which is deviated away from the fundamental value. Uh, they're doing so for the benefit of their family at the expense of the other shareholders. Um, so for the Songong Glass, they're minority outside shareholders uh, because their company value is uh, valued at a lower uh, price, they are in disadvantage. So they lose. The private company, Kunjang Energy, they benefit, is heavily held by the two sides. Uh, thank you very thank much. You. Uh, please. Oh, I'm thank done. You. Yes. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, well, discussion is still going on, but uh, I reluctantly have to say uh, this is a, this is a time to close.